All right, good morning. I've, I've known Joe for many years. I was trying to figure how many, maybe it might be 25 years, is it? And I've heard him speak maybe more. I've heard him speak at many conferences over the years in states, I mean, all over the US, as well as Mississippi and Alabama, where we've been working for many years. And I always learn something new. I mean, I've seen a lot of his talks, but there are always new tidbits in there. So I hope you picked up a lot about plastic culture from that last talk. Joe covered the overview of plastic culture with emphasis on field plastic culture, plastic mulch, strip irrigation, very thorough. I'm gonna move um, up to the next level of plastic culture, which is the high tunnel and greenhouse area. And uh, it's, it's an overview of those, and then uh, you'll get much more detailed talks as the day goes on. Okay, ready? Okay, so basics of tomato management in structures. And for, for this conference, the most important word on that slide is tomatoes. But I have to admit, the most important word on the slide for me personally is retired. It's, it's been, thank you, uh, hold the gifts. Um, it's it's been almost two years, and I've really enjoyed it. And and you know, after two years of evaluation, I I do think it's better than work. Okay, so just want to let you know that. So uh, those of you thinking about retiring in the next year or so, no names. So we're talking about growing beautiful tomatoes, and you can do that in the field, but when you move them into a protected structure like a high tunnel or a greenhouse. Um, your your odds of producing beautiful tomatoes goes up. And that's because of a lot of factors, a lot of environmental factors that you have much better control over in the greenhouse. The structures are for modifying the environment. I mean, we, we have to get to the beginning. Why bother with structures? Don't they cost money? Well, yes, they do cost money. So why bother with a structure when you, you have a lot of earth, you have a lot of ground, well, structures let you modify the environment, okay? So you can change things. The biggest factor is temperature, right? You can keep out that cold weather. You can turn on uh, the heater in a, in a greenhouse. You can get it where you want it. You can also somewhat modify light, pests, air pollutants, water. I say water because in the tropics, uh, high tunnels and greenhouses are used to keep that tropical rain out, where you might get 110 inches of rain a year, you don't want that. You want to restrict it to keep diseases down. Um, and allow, it allows production of the crop when you couldn't do it otherwise, in the, that's the greenhouse. And in the tunnel, it allows you to start earlier and to end later. So as, as Joe mentioned in his talk, when you start a week to three weeks earlier, your crop is worth more money. It can be a lot more money. And it is the same as at the end of the season. You get a hard freeze, the field producers, they're out of business temporarily. They're out of business. But you're still picking another week, another month from a high tunnel. That's fantastic. Th those are valuable tomatoes or whatever other vegetables you're growing. So as you move up from plastic mulch, you're going up row covers, uh, we didn't really get into, but then high tunnels and greenhouses. Is this a laser? Oh, look at this. Uh, into greenhouses, the cost does go up, and it goes up fairly quickly once you get above plastic mulch, but the crop value goes up at an even sharper curve. So the benefits uh, outweigh the costs. Now, I'm not saying everybody should start with greenhouses. The choice of what kind of protection you want is based on your farm enterprise, uh, your timing, what other things you do on the farm. You might have livestock, you might have chickens, uh, you might have uh, agronomic crops. So it has to fit into the whole program. So in structures, higher quality and higher value. They're locally grown. Now I'm comparing these to shipped in tomatoes from, from Florida, from South Texas, wherever, uh, south of the border. They're, they are vine ripened, very important. Vine ripened tomatoes, not shipped green and then gassed with ethylene to turn them. 
uh, so they're not breakers. Uniform size, shape, and color. They're nice and red. They taste good. They're vine ripened. They're local. They're going to taste good. So you're looking at higher value from structures. So it looks easy sometimes when, when people um, see magazine articles, uh, newspaper articles. Sometimes it, it looks, wow, this is cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. Um, but there is a lot to learn. That's what, that's what you're doing here. Um, I understand that there are like 50 people here and something like 5,000 on Zoom is what I hear. Is that right? 5,000, give or take. Okay, so a lot of people trying to learn today. So growers, there's, there's a lot to learn before getting in. There's a lot to learn every single year you're doing it. You'll always learn more if you're, if you're watching, paying attention. So, and, and, and I'm just saying that's the beginning. You learn every year. Okay, so uh, whether you're on a small family-run farm, and most tomato growers in the country are small family farms. Uh, most uh, high tunnel and greenhouse are small farms. Or whether you have multi-acre ranges, and I mean, there are, acre, there are greenhouse ranges that are over 100 acres, like over 100 acres under glass or plastic. They're huge. A lot of the concepts are really the same. So you grow the tomatoes and then you sell the tomatoes because you're in business. If you're a hobbyist, you don't really worry about selling the tomatoes. You're growing them for fun. You're growing them to show off to your neighbors that you're better than they are. I mean, you're, you're consuming them yourself. You're giving away to your relatives, whatever. But if you're in the business, you're, you're very concerned with selling the tomatoes and making a profit. The profit is where, where it's at if you're in business. So you have to know where you're going to sell them. First off, so you check out the market, you decide if you want to be a wholesaler or a retailer. The wholesale is pretty hard if you're small, if you're a small family run farm. You can still do it though. If you're a small grower, you probably want to sell very locally, local produce stands, uh, farmers markets, uh, direct marketing, and then have several buyers lined up. And uh, we're going to get into all that. Oh, I know. But there's just a delay. That's all. You press it and then you wait. And then it, okay. I think that's it. So the greenhouse structure, um, I have several publications I've written over the years. Uh, they're all online. Unless Mississippi State deleted them because I because they deleted me. I mean, because I deleted me from their faculty list. Um, but then they're free. So if they're still online, they're free. I didn't bring any with, with me. I, I uh, don't have access to those anymore. So in the back of the handbook, this is the main one I'm referring you to, the Greenhouse Tomato Handbook, and you can all find it online. Um, there's a list of vendors. So I recommend looking on that list, picking out several companies and getting quotes for what you want. So you figure out what size, where you, wanna, where you want the greenhouse to be located. Um, will you be selling locally like on site, do you want people to come to the greenhouse or do you want to sell, do you want to bring them to the vendors, to the stores? Plan for drainage. There should be a one to 2% slope where the greenhouse or high tunnel is so that you don't puddle up in there. You don't want pools of water. Forced ventilation um, is uh, mainly exhaust fans and then intake vents. And then a heating system. This is for greenhouses, okay? And I'm gonna get into the difference. Here we go, it comes. So the high structure, the high tunnel structure is, there are a lot of similarities in terms of figure out what size you want, the location, are you selling on site, plan for drainage. It is a much lower cost structure than a greenhouse. Usually it's a single layer cover Whereas usually the greenhouse is double layer, like double layer air inflated or polycarbonate, something more expensive. Um, it's normally passive ventilation rather than active with fans. And uh, you can ventilate through side walls or end walls. And then uh, by definition, it doesn't have a heating system and it doesn't have electricity. But you know what? I've seen so many variations on high tunnels over the years. Like every possible, I used to go in a high tunnel and if I saw a fan in there, I'd say, that's a greenhouse. Because to me, it is. Once you have electricity and forced air, it's a greenhouse. 
but I've seen some high tunnels with um, automated sides that go up and down um, and end walls, uh, some with um, uh, horizontal airflow fans that circulate the air, some with heating systems in them. I mean, to me, those are greenhouses. So the, it's a little gray between what's what, but um, some of the major differences, let's talk about that. Greenhouses are typically hydroponic. So you're taking a chemical fertilizer that dissolves completely in water and using that. So soluble fertilizers and you're using injectors of some kind, drip system. Uh, bulk tank or injectors for mixing the fertilizer and in the greenhouse, use greenhouse varieties of tomatoes, not field varieties. It's very important to use a greenhouse variety. They, they're much better adapted. And then you harvest fall and spring. You can harvest clear through the winter. In most places in the, in the from here south, you can't really harvest in the summer because of the heat. Um, maybe you can in northern Missouri. I'm, I'm not really sure. High tunnel, here's the difference. It's normally in-ground production. Your, your plants are in the soil. They're not in bags or buckets. It's more similar to field grown, much more similar. Pruning and support is like in the field. You know, you might use a, a stake and weave system. We just call it Florida weave everywhere except in Florida. I don't call it that. Stake and weave. Um, pruning and support is just like in the field. Field varieties, you, you don't really want to spend the money on greenhouse varieties to grow in a tunnel. The seeds can be 50 cents, 75 cents per seed for greenhouse varieties that are adapted to greenhouses. And then in the high tunnel, you can harvest early and late season. Uh, winter is very limited, you know, unless you're in a climate that where it doesn't really, you don't really get a hard freeze. Uh, you might get away with it in the winter. So those are the main differences. So a greenhouse or tunnel? Well, you, this is, which should you use? Well, it has to fit into your farm enterprise, your timing for labor, conflict with other crops, other farm systems. And then this is important in some areas, the tax codes. We're, we're not gonna talk about taxes, but in some states, Greenhouses are considered a permanent structure and they're taxed like a permanent structure, whereas a high tunnel is considered a temporary structure because you can change the cover. You can you can literally drag it and move it. Um, yes, there's a question. Oh, wow. OK, so that's another factor in some states, I guess, like in Missouri, if you're if your posts are in concrete, they're considered permanent. And then you're taxed that way. So that, that's another important thing to think about when you're deciding what, what to do. Um, and then the capital expense, upfront costs. Yes, the greenhouse costs a lot more than a tunnel. Tunnel costs a lot more than plastic mulch. But think about this. There are still some grants from NRCS that will pay, what, 85%? Is it around there of the cost of the tunnel? They still... Okay. Okay, that's interesting. It varies by state. In some states, they specify what your square footage should be, and then they pay 80 to 85% of it. After you buy it, you have to buy it, install it. They have to check to make sure you did build it. Then you turn in your receipts and get reimbursed. But that's a really good way even if it's 50% uh, reimbursement, really good way to get started in, in a tunnel. And if you're thinking about it, you should go ahead and do it before they quit doing this. It's not, not a permanent thing. So language, there's a lot of language to learn like in any area of uh, te technology. Um, you need to learn uh, what is a cluster, what's an internode, what is IPM. So I do have this publication also online called Greenhouse Tomato Growers Glossary and everything in there should apply to tunnels and other systems as well. So the biggest question I get the most often is, um, is about size. People wanna start, people have never grown a greenhouse 
before they've never grown anything in a greenhouse and thinking of starting with 12 greenhouses for a first time, never done it before. And I'm always uh, rolling my eyes with when they, you know, if it's a phone call, not in person and telling them, look, just, just start with one and do it for a year, learn, learn how to do it, make mistakes, fix your mistakes and then expand. Well, this is the only grower who ever listened to me. You know, my, I had 33 years at Mississippi State. Only one grower ever listened. He started small. And he did so well that in the following year, he was able to double. So who's going to do all the work? If, if you do have one greenhouse, like the one in the previous slide, or a single bay, or one high tunnel, you can probably do all the work yourself. But if you're getting into four tunnels, uh, a two bay greenhouse system, uh, you really have to start about start thinking about hiring part-time labor, or if, you, if you're lucky enough to have family labor, relatives, kids um, who can pitch in and do some work in exchange for tomatoes, that, that's great. But uh, labor has to be lined up ahead of time. Temperature in the greenhouse, your minimum temperature this is talking about winter, is 64 for tomatoes. You really don't want it any colder than 64, not just for yield, but for quality. You want high quality tomatoes. And fans try to keep it under 90. It gets hot in the summer. It gets hot in the spring. In Mississippi, it gets hot in April. You really have to start, oops, I touched my microphone. Um, you really have to start thinking about cooling um, in April. Vents, horizontal airflow fans, shade materials, all of these things help you control the, the high temperature in the greenhouse. And the air movement is very, very important. Whether it's a tunnel or a greenhouse, you want the air to be moving through the greenhouse, through the, through the plants. So how many plants? This is greenhouse. Five square feet per plant is what I came down to in the research that I did. Anything more crowded than that, you have more plants, and the same yield, the same yield per greenhouse. The yield doesn't go up if you put in more plants than this. So that's, if you have a, say a 30 by 96, that's like 576 plants. So that's what I'd call a, a, a greenhouse full. Um, and these are, these are laid, uh, th these are the upright bags with two plants per bag. That's a seven and a half gallon bag. The plants are, are set up so they spread out as they go up. And you do that by having a wire, uh, two wires above each row that are three feet apart. So your plants are next to each other, but you train the plants to the wires. And that spreads them out and it lets um, sun get into the plant canopy so you get better photosynthesis, better crop yield. So what kind of tomato to grow? And there are thousands there. There have been about 20,000 varieties over the years that plant breeders have come up with. But for the greenhouse, you really want a greenhouse variety. You want one that's bred for greenhouse light conditions, greenhouse humidity conditions, and it will do the best in your greenhouse. For a high tunnel, you want a field variety. And I'll show you some examples of, of good varieties that are good in the field and they're really good in the high tunnel. So you're looking for a high yield, good fruit size, red color, excellent disease resistance, and not a lot of disorders. My second talk will get into disorders. So for greenhouse, the beefsteak type, that means the large tomato, almost always red. These other varieties, these the grapes and the cherries, yes, they'll grow in there, but uh, you won't always get enough uh, higher price for what you sell them to to make it worth all the extra labor it takes a lot more labor to pick cherry tomatoes right because they're they're sort of tiny so you deviate if you can get enough uh higher price for the other types greenhouse varieties these are the my top three that i've been recommending over the years big dina trust and geronimo and these other types are are out in the industry and um, they're worth investigating, but those are my top three. And then cluster types are the ones you see in some mainly big big box stores that are in a bag. They're a mesh bag and the fruit are still on the cluster. 
And some of the very large growers like to grow the cluster types. And those are some of the varieties that are out there. For tunnel, uh, there are some that do very well in the tunnel. And this is a smattering. This uh, Primo Red is one of the, one of the uh, most recommended ones for high tunnels. But I mean, definitely consider these others. Red Deuce, what, this is one of the BHN varieties. Uh, these mountain varieties have done well. Celebrity, which is great in home garden. It's great uh, as a field variety. It'll do uh, pretty well in the greenhouse as well. I mean, in the tunnel. So here's what you're looking at. From the greenhouse, you're looking at uniformity and size, shape, color. So that when the produce buyer is, is putting them on the shelf in the, in the, uh, in the grocery store, uh, you don't have a big mishmash in sizes or colors. They all look pretty similar. So what should you, you grow them in? What's your growing medium? In the tunnel, it's easy. You're growing them in the ground. You can grow them in containers, but typically they're in the ground. So in the greenhouse, um, pine bark is our most used variety in the deep south, Mississippi, and a lot in Alabama, Tennessee. It's a lot of pine bark, but perlite is probably the most common growing medium uh, in the U.S. for small to mid-sized growers. For large, large growers, rock wool is very common because they can lay out, you know, 10 acres in, in, in no time. It's very lightweight. Uh, coconut core is also another excellent medium. It just costs more. So I'm, I'm recommending for a small grower, look at pine bark or perlite. Irrigation, uh, Joe mentioned this in his, that it does need to be designed. It's not something you throw together because you want all the plants in there to get the same water because when they're getting water, they're getting fertilized. You want them to have similar fertilizer and water. You don't want uh, the, the lower end to get a lot more water and the higher end to get much less because they'll get less fertilizer too. So you get help from an, from an ag engineer. Choose the emitters, uh, you need filters, and then plan for fertigation, which is mixing fertilizer and water together, it's called fertigation. And whether you want a bulk tank system or some type of injector system. The fertilizers in the greenhouse need to be a greenhouse hydroponic fertilizer. So you don't want 20, 20, 20, which is great for regular greenhouse ornamentals, uh, hanging baskets, bedding plants, not for greenhouse tomatoes. It, it will not do well at all. So you want a uh, greenhouse hydroponic fertilizer, and there are several companies listed in the back of the handbook. You want the pH in that 5.6 to 5.8 range, so those nutrients will be the most available to your plants and get a regular tissue analysis. We'll talk more about that in this afternoon's talk. So you take, a, you take 10 to 12 leaves from the greenhouse, not more than one per plant, sort of random, no sickly leaves, send them to the lab and they will tell you what you have enough of, what you have too much of, and that will help you adjust your fertilizer. Suckering, we do need to talk about this to make sure everybody's on board. This is a tomato plant. It has a main stem. You're pruning to one main stem. Every leaf has a leaf axle. And in every leaf axle, there's a shoot, which is called a sucker or an axillary shoot or a side shoot, same thing. So those need to be removed. Otherwise you'll have more than one main stem. So once a week you go through, remove the suckers. Is this a sucker at the top of the plant? No, no. I've seen, um, let's just say home gardeners make the mistake of thinking that was a sucker and snapping it off. Well. End of the plant, you don't want to do that. So what makes tomatoes taste good? Everybody cares about tomato flavor and you should. The thing that makes sure they'll taste good is having the correct fertility, not too weak. And uh, the higher EC, the, the amount of fertilizer dissolved in the water does increase the flavor but you only increase it up to a point. 
correct pH. Lower pH gives them more acidic flavor, which is good too. Uh, vine ripened allows the sugars to develop more completely. So you get the sweetness and of course, lots of sun. You can't really control the sun, but um, if you're growing through an extended cloudy, rainy, dark period, they won't have the same flavor. Support system refers to holding the plants up. In a greenhouse, the structure is pretty solid and you run the wires and attach them to the end walls in the greenhouse and it will hold up. The, the plants can get pretty heavy because if you have 600 plants and they all have a load of tomatoes on them, it can weigh three to four tons. So the structure itself has to be really solid to do this. So I mentioned that the, the uh, V formation to spread the uh, strings out. And then, oh yeah, I put this in. My wife's a social worker. So I stuck this in, have a support system. You know, it, I'm not talking about group therapy, but hey, it may not be a bad thing, you know, it might help. So pruning, prune to one main stem, remove the suckers once a week, and then you twist the string around stem or vice versa once a week. You tie, you tie the, uh, you clip or you tie the string to the base of the plant, and then you just twist it or clip it once a week. And you, you uh, clip under a leaf, not under a flower cluster. You don't want to risk hurting your flowers. They're valuable. So once a week, and you keep going in the same direction all the way up the plant. Make sure your equipment is working, your heaters, fans, vents, emitters, everything. And the, the most important caution here is check the heaters maybe a month before you expect cold weather. Somebody gets caught every year. Somebody gets caught and it can be uh, simply, there's, there was no propane in the tank because I didn't need it all summer. It can, and this, all of these things have happened. It can be, um, it's a new greenhouse. The heater, the heater was hooked up, but it was never tested yet. And it's gonna be uh, 25 degrees tonight. Okay, well, get going. It needs to be tested ahead of time, make sure it works. It can also be a very old heater that's starting to leak, leak ethylene, and you don't want that. There, there are things to check, but make sure the heater works. Be a worrier. Is everybody in here a worrier? I am. Okay, so if you worry about your crop, uh, you'll be a better grower because it will make you check. It will make you double check your fertilizer mixing. It will make you check, make sure you're pollinating correctly. There's so many things. So use your EC and your pH meter to check that solution, especially right after you mix it. Check it, make sure it's right. Um, here's an, a simple trick that doesn't cost you anything. Use an extra gallon jug with an extra emitter somewhere in the line, at the end of your line, stick a, an old milk jug, gallon, extra emitter, stick it in there once a day, check how much water is in there, okay? So if, uh, if you call your extension expert and you say, my plants are wilting, what is that person gonna say? How much water are they getting per day? And if the answer is, I don't know, that's the wrong answer. If you tell them, well, it's getting about a quart of water per day. I know that because I have an extra jug. And if your plants are in there, he'll say, or she'll say, is it in your, how many clusters? Fifth cluster. Okay, well, a quart per day is not enough. You should be around two quarts per plant per day. So that extra free thing you can do with a jug will really help. So walk the greenhouse every day. These are not soybeans, okay? You don't plant them, spray them, pick them. You get in there every day and check on them. Digital diagnostics. Uh, let's see, this is Missouri. Does anybody here have a cell phone that takes pictures? Wow, okay. I'm not used to that. No, I'm kidding. So if you have a cell phone that takes pictures and you have a problem with your plants, take some pictures, send them to your county agent. County agent will answer or not answer. And if the county agent can't answer, you no, know, that person will send it up the chain to your area agent, your state specialist, whatever. Um, it will it'll get answered. And digital diagnostics is fast. I mean, often it's a same day thing. Sometimes you have to send a, a live sample into the lab because you can't tell from a picture. But I think 
uh, at least two thirds of the time, the questions are answered from pictures, not blurry pictures, good pictures. You can also get help from friends in the business and uh, anybody you know who has more experience. So when you're a grower, it's important to remember that you're also all of these. You're, of course, you're selling to make money, but you're a marketer, you're educating your buyers, you're educating the public about what's so good about it, you're promoting the product. Why should I get why should I buy uh, tomatoes from your from a high tunnel or a greenhouse that are grown? right here in Missouri? Well, they're locally grown. They're not shipped in from uh, a thousand miles away. They're not breakers. They're not gassed. So here are all, all those things I was just mentioning. They're more uniform in size and shape. Uh, these ripe tomatoes have really good nutrition and health benefits. Uh, lycopene is the pigment that makes them red. Lycopene is well known to uh, help prevent prostate cancer. Excellent quality, higher quality is higher value. So then you get to charge more, charge more than the field, field uh, tomatoes. And make sure you get that slide. Thank you. So you're selling quality. When do you harvest? Your harvest date is based on when you're going to sell them. Okay, so if you're selling at your greenhouse, people are coming and buying retail. People are buying uh, five pounds of tomatoes for um, what, $15 or whatever, um, you're gonna pick them pretty red. You want them red, somewhere in here. If you're delivering to us to grocery stores and, and, and it is wholesale, you'll be doing more of this. Pink, light red, because they, they have to have some in the back room that are still ripening and then they replenish as they go. If you're, if you're in the South, you do wanna have some green for fried green tomatoes. That's a retail thing, really. Do people in Missouri eat fried green tomatoes? Is it it's popular? Is it just in southern Missouri? I'm just curious. Everywhere? Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Stickers. These are the stickers. Greenhouse tomatoes are typically stickered. And the reason is it distinguishes them from field tomatoes that cost a lot less. So if there's a sticker, the buyer will learn that these are higher quality tomatoes. These are locally grown, buying ripened, not gas, not breakers, all that. So you put the essential information on a sticker, sticker every tomato. It's a very good sales thing to do. Publications, and I'm mentioning again, these are all on the website. They're free. You can get them yourself. This is the main one I'm referring you to for more information about this talk. Greenhouse Tomato Handbook. These others are on there too, and, and you can find them, including the, the glossary I mentioned before. So there's the handbook. I'm getting an Espanol. If you need a Spanish version, it's, it's there. And then you can go to this website if you want to find all the publications and a lot of other information, or Google is easier. If you Google, uh, say, Mississippi greenhouse tomatoes or Snyder greenhouse tomato or any combination of Mississippi and those words, um, you'll find that fact page. So whatever you want. And for high tunnels, this page is excellent. And Missouri is one of the cooperators on this page. Hightunnels.org. Don't forget the S hightunnels.org. There is so much information in there on high tunnels, cropping, uh, structures, varieties. It's, it's almost endless and it's kept pretty well up to date too. Highly recommend. Is there time for questions? Yes, there is. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, okay, questions. <laughs> yeah hello uh my first question is on the saccharin saccharin uh the saccharin should it be done to both determinate and indeterminate type of tomatoes that's my first question okay uh the question is on suckering 
And were you asking if they should be done on determinate and indeterminate or just about both? Yes, should it be done to both or one of them? Okay, uh, good question. On suckering, which is removing those side shoots. Um, in the greenhouse, the uh, you should only be growing indeterminate types. So indeterminate means they're not genetically determined to quit producing after a certain height. They will keep going until something kills them, whether it's disease or uh, yanking them out by the roots. You know, they'll keep producing. So determinate types are trained to one main stem. And one main stem uh, production means you're going to sucker them once a week. So you keep that one main stem. You never allow them to get too bushy or, or you'll have a very dense foliage that stays wet and might get diseased and it's a mess. In the high tunnel, it's a little different because most commercial field varieties are determinate. So determinate means the top of the plant ends in a flower cluster. Indeterminate, it ends in a, in a vegetative shoot. And the vegetative shoot will grow, make another flower cluster, another vegetative shoot, and it keeps going. The determinate ends in a flower cluster, which means it will develop fruit at the top. There's no more shoot. So it might get this tall or this tall, and it's done. So the field varieties that you grow in a high tunnel um, can be pruned. There's a little margin of how much you can prune them. The simplest thing is to prune them once. So you let you let one side shoot come up um, when the plant is small, allow that one, and then after that, remove all the suckers. Some people let uh, some people let it get a little bushier than that and might leave another shoot here and there. But um, I like that, that one. In the, if you're in the field and, and you have several hundred plants, you probably just want to prune them once. And it's similar in the, in the tunnel. Does that answer your question? Yes, sure. Okay. And my second question is, with the medium, uh, mm -hmm. like let's say the coconut uh, medium, how long can one use the medium? How long? And oh, if yeah. one intends to look to use it for a very long time, can it be affected by pathogens like, let's say, Fusarium mold? Yeah. Uh, how long can you use the growing medium? Now, these are when you're in bags or buckets, like in, in a greenhouse, right? You, um, my rule of thumb on those for the greenhouse, I work mostly with growers with pine bark, which is an excellent growing medium. Uh, it's composted pine bark fine. So it's not nuggets. It's not big chunks like you use in landscaping. They're fine pieces and they are composted. So they're not uh, getting hot in the bags. My rule of thumb on, on, on the medium is two years, but it's based on this. If after the first year of using it, you are getting some root borne diseases like fusarium or pythium, then chuck it and start new. But after the first year, if you're really not getting diseases like that, use it a second year. Now, if you want, you can evaluate it after the second year, but the odds of getting diseases in there after two years goes up. So uh, your insurance is take it out after the second year and start new. And that pretty much applies to whatever growing medium you're using, whether it's pine bark, coconut core, uh, perlite. Now, there are some systems especially with perlite where you can sanitize it. You know, if you want to do that, I, I would look, look online, look on YouTube. Um, uh, Louisiana State University had a professor who did a lot of research into sanitizing the perlite every year and reusing it. And he reused it for many years. If you want to look that up, his last name is Hannah, H-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Hannah. And his first name is also Hannah. So it's easy to find, Hannah, Hannah. Um, very good research, and he, and he was an expert at, at uh, sanitizing the perlite and reusing it. I can't remember how many years he got out of it, but 10, 15 years, no diseases. So it can be done. Other questions? Yeah, I think I have two more questions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, can uh, high temperature, yes. can it have effect on uh, flower abortion? High yeah. temperature. Okay. Can then let me add the last question. Yes. Excess irrigation. Can it have can it cause cracking in the tomato fruit? Excess irrigation. 
or applying so much water to there. Okay, two but, questions. One is high temperature, one is excess water. Yeah. Okay, uh, we will get into both of those in the second talk. So I'll just give you the capsule, the summary. Um, high temperature can cause flower abortion. It's one of the things that can kill flowers. And there are several reasons it will do that. But once the flower is dead, of course, it's not going to produce a tomato. So high temperature in the 90s is not good. And there's not one set temperature where, say, up to 92, they're fine. Above 92, no set. It's, it's more like it's going to decrease sharply as it gets into the 90s. So, yeah, that's a problem. And um, too much water, okay, well, too much water, um, your, your growing medium should be draining very well. So that's one factor. If you have a little too much water, it should be draining out. But the bigger problem is, is sharp changes in the water. So like if you, if you don't have enough water and then you compensate by putting on too much water, then you can get fruit cracking. And this can also happen inadvertently. Like suppose you're putting on just the right amount of water and then it's cloudy for a week. Well, that same amount of water is now too much water because there's not a lot of sun, there's not a lot of transpiration and you can also get cracking. So yes, too much water is a problem, too high temperature is a problem. And there are so many other problems we're gonna talk about this afternoon. All right, great questions. Um, does anybody else in the audience have any questions? Okay, we'll ponder that. I got a couple uh, in the chat here, Dr. Okay. Schneider. Oh, great. Um, how feasible is it to grow heirloom tomatoes in a high tunnel? Okay, can you grow heirloom tomatoes in a high tunnel? Yes, you, you certainly can. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few comments on heirloom tomatoes. Heirloom tomatoes have a really nice reputation now. They're getting the good rap because um, some of them do taste better. Uh, most of them are pretty uh, ugly. I mean, they're not, they're not pretty tomatoes. And people have come to associate ugly tomatoes with good flavor. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes ugly tomatoes are just ugly, okay? And they still taste awful. So... Um, if you really like the heirloom tomatoes and you have buyers who want those heirloom tomatoes, definitely consider growing them. But keep in mind, heirloom tomatoes do not have as good disease resistance. They're more likely to get diseases that the newer hybrids won't get. Secondly, your yields will not be as high. Okay, they just won't. The, the newer varieties get better yields. So you have to weigh these things, but I'm not saying don't grow them. They will grow. There's no reason they won't grow, but just be prepared for possibly more diseases, lower yield, and um, make sure you get a good, a good price for them. Make sure it's what your consumers want. If they want the heirloom tomato, I mean, you might say I have brandy lime, brandy lime, brandy wine and uh, the German and the black and the and the zebras and all these things and it will bring people in so if you and if you can charge a good price for them go for it yeah and uh if you'll be on the farm tour tomorrow we'll be visiting a grower and he's starting to grow some varieties that are hybridized but also have some of the fruit quality look and flavor um, that some of the heirlooms have yes uh, I'll, I'll do one more comment on that if there's still time um one of the brilliant plant breeders at NC State, who is retired now, Randy Gardner, came up with this concept of, I mean, he's been breeding tomato varieties his whole career, but coming up with varieties that are heirloom-like. In other words, they look like heirlooms, but they have good disease resistance. This is pretty smart because that they, you know, he's, and he is looking at flavor. So good flavor, maybe not the same appearance as a celebrity tomato, um, but good disease resistance. So you can grow them and get a good yield out of it. Well, thank you. Uh, another question in the chat. Can you explain the breaker stage more specifically and why not to pick at breaker stage? Okay, what is the breaker stage in a tomato? A breaker stage in a tomato is when the, the blossom end, which is the bottom of the tomato, starts to show a little bit of color. 
you might see a hint of yellow, yellowish pink. It's just starting to show. And a lot of commercial growers uh, further south mostly will pick them at the breaker stage because the fruit is still very firm. It will ship well. Of course, you want to you want don't want your tomatoes turning into ketchup in the truck. You want them staying solid. So they're shipped at that breaker stage. And then when they get to the destination, they are gassed with ethylene, which is a naturally occurring hormone in plants, but it's a higher rate of ethylene and that forces them to ripen. So it softens the cell wall, develops some red color, but unfortunately they won't have the full flavor of a vine ripened tomato. So for greenhouses and tunnels, you don't wanna pick them at the breaker stage. You want them to have decent color. Cool, thank you. Um... In a high tunnel, how long can you expect the covering to last on that high tunnel? Okay, um, I'll talk about tunnel and greenhouse covers. How long should they last? Plastic manufacturers design them uh, for a certain length of time. There are one-year plastics. There are two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year, and six-year plastics. So in a greenhouse, I'll mention greenhouse first, uh, you don't want to be changing that plastic every year. So you want a three-year plastic at least. Of course, the cost goes up. A two-year plastic will cost less than a three-year plastic. A five-year plastic will cost a lot more, but it's less labor changing it. And if you leave it on too long, it, it gets dirty, it gets dust, it might get mildew, it might get just junk on it from the field that blows on it, and it might yellow a little bit. So your light transmission drops with time. And as your light transmission goes down, your yield goes down. This is solid research. So the longer you leave it on, the less production you have. In the tunnel, it's the same thing. You, you probably want to change tunnel plastic, I would think, every, every two years, two to three years. Joe, you might know better than that. Two to three years? Okay, two to three years. You, you, in a tunnel, you might not want a five-year, four-year, five-year plastic because after a couple of years, you want to take that plastic off and let the rain come in there and maybe wash out some of your excess salts um, in the soil. And if you have the NRCS grant, there are requirements on how long the plastic should stay on before you let it, let it get washed by uh, rain. Um, another question in the chat here. Can you get more than one season out of the drip line in a high tunnel? Okay, can you get more than one season out of a drip line in a high tunnel? you should be able to get more than one season out of the drip. Um, yes, it's, it's not as exposed as it is out in the field. And uh, there are different uh, thicknesses of drip, just like Joe was mentioning different thicknesses of the, of the plastic mulch and thicker ones, of course, you can reuse for a number of years. If you get the cheapest one um, and you have um, animals or mole crickets or something chewing it, yeah, you might develop some leaks. I wouldn't go with the cheapest grade. Cool, thank you. Um, any other questions out here in the audience? Okay, I'm not seeing anything else in the chat here. Um, so thank you, Dr. Snyder. Um, we will.